Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Links UK Trust consultation event. Um, my name is Dr. Paul O'Donoghue. I'm director of Links UK Trust, and I'm joined today by Dominic Woodfield, who's director of Bioscan. Um, today, we'll give you a quite a lot of information about the project. We'll tell you um, the background to how we've got to where we are. We'll give you what we believe to be the rationale for, for Links. We'll obviously talk about consultation, of which this is a key part, and the next steps in the licensing procedure. And we'll also uh, emphasize the differences from last time. As, as most of you, if not all of you will know, um, we did submit a license previously, which was rejected. And we'll go through those grounds for rejection and why we think resubmission will work. So just, just a little bit about me, why, why I'm interested in conservation, why I'm talking to you about links to why I think uh, I'm able to deliver this project. So I've worked in conservation for 25 years. Um, around 15 years of that, I was working in Africa. I've worked in anti-poaching. Um, I've worked in large mammal conservation, translocation, genetic management. Um, also close to home, I've been involved in um, predator human conflict mitigation. So I've worked in Romania, uh, catching brown bears, relocating those animals. So I understand um, how people live with predators, the issues around that, and how, how they're mitigated and, and resolved. Um, again, even closer to home, this project I'm, I'm very fond of and very proud of. Um, this is the, these are great bustards, and I was involved in the reintroduction of great bustards back to the UK. Um, that project's a success. There's now breeding great bustards in the UK. Uh, for the first time in hundreds of years. Uh, fantastic project, very well received. Um, and I provided the scientific advice on which birds to bring in to that project and also some of the practical issues as well. And then uh, and a, a topic that's very close to my heart and, and uh, Dominic's as well is Scottish wildcats, uh, the UK if not the world's rarest cat. So I've been involved in, in wildcat conservation for around 10 years now. I'll let Dominic explain who he is. Hi, um, I'm Dominic Whitfield. I'm um, Managing Director of an environmental consultancy called Bioscan that specializes in applied ecology. Um, I'm a chartered ecologist, a chartered environmentalist and a full member of the Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. Uh, I have 26 years professional practice as, as an ecologist as an environmental planning consultant and most of my work over that time has been environmental impact assessment related work um, a lot of it for the development sector but in part also for the conservation sector as well so everything ranging from large infrastructure developments port expansions uh, rail infrastructure uh, large-scale housing developments and quarries right through to impact assessments um, of uh, habitat management plans for designated nature conservation sites and also research including habitat research and species research and monitoring uh, invertebrates and um, birds mainly. Um, to this project uh, Paul got me involved largely to deal with some of the regulatory matters that had come out of the previous application uh, in particular the habitats regulations assessment process which falls out of the conservation of habitats and species regulations, which itself is a UK implementation of the European Habitats Directive. That's still in force and will still be in force for the foreseeable future despite Brexit. So that comes with it some um, regulatory matters, um, assessment processes to ensure that uh, anything you do, any kind of project, and this of course is a project, uh, doesn't have significant impacts on the environment. i hand you back to Paul. Thanks Dominic. So um, I'm always asked this, um, how did it start? Why are you doing this? Um, so as I've been involved in conservation for a long time, and I think it's been a lot of talking about apex predators, a lot of talking in particular about lynx for, for decades. And I felt that the time was right to, to look at this issue and to actually see if it was possible and see if there was public appetite for it. So um, we launched the idea in the Sunday Times and then we followed up with a public survey to just test the water, test what the mood was in the UK. And it was, the response was incredible. And we had over nine and a half thousand um, responses to our survey in six days, I think. 
and over 92, I think 92.8% of those respondents were positive. So that kind of reinforced my feeling and our feeling that this was a, a reasonable idea and something definitely worth pursuing. But, you know, I think a lot of people involved in conservation get frustrated and things take a long time. And everyone seems to talk about 25-year timescales. Everything's done in 25 years, but we haven't got 25 years to wait. And I think the world is showing us that more than ever. Um, but, you know, also, apart from the fact that, you know, we want to do th get things done, get things moving, move forward, um, projects, the academic scientific research coming out of the UK is clear and, un and unambiguous. So the State of Nature report, which has been, which has been done, um, and there's been updated versions of this, have shown the, the dire state of the UK countryside. It's certainly shown that green is not good. Just because something looks green doesn't mean it's diverse. In fact, sometimes it can be incredibly um, depauperate. So, I mean, this is, this is fairly grim reading, and, it, and it's quite shocking, really. It was, so the State of Nature report showed that 50% of species declined, with 40% showing strong or moderate declines. And the UK has lost significantly more nature over the long term than the global average, which is unbelievable given um, our level of consciousness about this issue and our, our kind of economic development. There's a massive disconnect between um, our economic development and how we look after the world around us. So what exactly is a Lynx UK Trust seeking to do? So I'm going to be absolutely clear, this is not a reintroduction. This is, we are not applying to reintroduce Lynx to the UK. We obviously think that that is something that needs to be looked at in the future, but our job, our, our aim and our kind of goals are to seek the necessary license to conduct a highly regulated five-year scientific trial, the trial being the operative word, studying the effects of Eurasian links on selected sites in Scotland and or England. And I can't say this enough, and we'll say this more than once, and Dominic will back me up on this. The point of this trial is that it's fully reversible at any point. And our license, is, our license application is full of um, discussion on exit strategies, should they be needed. Although, obviously, we don't think that they will be. So, you know, a lot of you... And we've seen that by the informed question that we got in, which is fantastic. Know a lot about Lynx already. But for those of you who are, who are relatively new to this topic, um, a Lynx is a, a medium-sized cat. It's not a big cat. You know, it's definitely not a big cat. It's not a tiger. It's not a lion. It's not a leopard, jaguar, puma. It's a medium-sized cat. 18 to 30 kilograms, which puts it, puts it around the size of a, it's not very flattering, but I call it a skinny Labrador. You know, it's kind of the same height and length but not as bulky and uh, the primary prey they're a roe deer specialist um, that's what they feed on predominantly across their range um, sometimes up to 95 percent of the diet and again this is you know it's, it's clear from the scientific literature from from behavior studies they are woodland specialists and they are highly secretive in fact in some places in europe they call them the ghost cat because you know they're there but you don't see them um, they've got an extensive uh, links and links um, subspecies. They've got extensive range. The Eurasian lynx, which we're talking about here, um, ranges from Scandinavia, Romania, through through Russia. So a huge range. Um, and you'll see, in as we look in Europe, pockets of lynx. Those pockets are actually growing now as reintroductions are taking place, and lynx are actually colonising naturally. And we'll come on to that later but maybe at this point i'll say that um, it's my strong belief that if it wasn't for the english channel here links would already be back so what is the history of links in the uk so without doubt they were widespread across the uk so um i know people who are the braver than me they they do cave in they go into limestone caves they collect um ancient bones and remains, and they found evidence of lynx bones literally all over the UK. I mean, from the top of Scotland to, to Devon and Cornwall and everywhere in between, including um, Northumberland and North Yorkshire. The carbon dating and the uh, cultural evidence suggest they were hunted out about 1,300 years ago, which is, which is a reasonable amount of time. Um, the reasons for the extinction, um, predominantly 
hunting and trapping for their pelt, although there was obviously habitat loss, which at the same time makes um, animals more vulnerable to exploitation because of the edge effect of habitats being broken up. But yeah, it was predominantly hunting and trapping for the fur trade. So they were they were um, killed for the beauty, and that that sad that that saddens me on a on a, on a moral level. It really does. Um, since then, the UK has experienced huge amounts of reforestation, not enough um, for anybody's um, liking, which is why there's so many planting schemes, but a lot of reforestation. There's obviously the complete cessation now of fur trapping and trading. It's, it's a social no-no. It will, it will never be kind of reinvigorated, thankfully, and that, that barbaric practice is, is gone. And uh, this, this picture to me uh, is a very interesting picture. It shows a pack of hunting dogs, um, which is tree to lynx. You know, that's how they used to hunt lynx. And it's a sad picture for me because the lynx's natural instinct when threatened would be to, to go up a tree to, to get out of the way. And that's when the people would come in and, and dispatch this animal. And, and that's, that picture is a, is a very sad one to me, a very poignant one. But that would have been likely how the last lynx in the UK was was killed. And like I say, that, that does make me uh, sad. So lynx in the UK, um, times have changed. Lynx are now likely to thrive in many areas of Scotland and England, especially given the abundance of prey. I don't think there's, there's many people who would argue that the UK isn't overpopulated here. There's, you know, the scientific evidence is clear that it is. And... The likelihood of lynx thriving is, is very strongly backed up by both uh, previous and very recent scientific research, which I'll come on to later. But there is, there is complete scientific consensus that the UK can support a population of lynx, a sustainable population of lynx. Um, that, that's now, I, I think, you know, beyond scientific doubt, given that there's multiple studies that are showing consistently the same results. And Kielder, being the biggest single forest block in Britain, is obviously... Um, a prime location for that. So as with any species um, reintroduction or translocation, this is a, this is a translocation, um, we would have to follow the IUCN guidelines for reintroductions and other conservation translocations. So just to be clear, this is a, a long document. It's a very useful document and it highlights best practice. And this is actually how the government assess applications. They, they effectively look at these guidelines and look at our application and assess how it, how it concurs. And the, a key point in there, it's very important, is that there needs to be strong evidence that the threats that caused any previous thing, extinction have been correctly identified and removed or sufficiently reduced. Well, we can say that, thankfully. Um, you know, we wouldn't be putting links back if there was still a, a thriving fur trade or no forest. So, you know, that, that's a really big tick in the box. I and mean, we wouldn't, you know, on a personal level, wouldn't want to put links anywhere that they're not suited to. That would be just pointless. Um, I won't go into too much detail on, on these, but on this presentation will be available for people to go through and dig out and look at the legislation and follow up on papers. We'll mention quite a few papers as we go through. But, you know, there's key, there's key articles of the international law which still apply post-Brexit. Um, which refer to um, the need to carry out and the, and the obligation actually to carry out um, trial releases to look at the re-establishment of extinct animals. And, you know, Article 22 of the Council Directive, the Berne Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity, most of you will have heard about these directives, these pieces of legislation, and, and they underpin um, the IUCN translocation guidelines and the rationale this project. But again, I emphasize the trial. So what will this trial involve? It'll be time limited, five years. Um, that's what we're applying for. That's on our license. That will be that will be clear. There'll be a start and an end date with five years in between. We will observe, measure, and analyze literally everything. That's what we want to do. We're we're scientists, we're ecologists. This is this is what we what we do, what we want to do. And we want to look at both the natural, social and economic environment. So how it affects the forests, how it affects the ecology, how it affects people's um, livelihoods, how it affects both positive and negative, how it affects the economic um, environment, 
how it affects how people feel about areas, how it affects um, the kind of the nation's psyche on a, on a national level. Does it make us feel like we're living in a, in a more wilder, more healthy, thriving country? How does the countryside feel? How do people working in the countryside feel? All these issues. And we'll collect all this data. It's a huge job. But this will enable Natural England, Nature Scott, uh, to make evidence-based decisions regarding the long-term desirability of links in the UK. So that, so this will, it, it's not our decision after this trial whether links are reintroduced. That's the government's decision. Our job is to provide the evidence. And again, if at any point in this trial exit strategies uh, are needed, it's entirely reversible at any point. So we've previously done um, a lot of work. As you'll know, um, we've been to Kielder numerous times. We've had teams of people working in Kielder. We've done you know, at least five public events in village halls. We'll have met hope, a lot of you probably watching this now. Um, we've done farmers stakeholder meetings, business stakeholder meetings. We've been to campsites, the local pub, the school. We've, you know, we've, we've really um, spoke to a lot of people and, you know, I, I, you'll probably, anyone who knows me or, you know, you probably tell I, I'm not, I'm not a massive Zoom fan or online consultation fan. I'd rather do things face to face, um, but we can't. Simple as that, you know, but this is not instead of face to face. This is on top of extensive consultation that's, that's been done before. And, you know, we would love to be in Kielder tonight, um, but for very obvious reasons, we're not. Um, and, and the thing is why we decided to, we have been waiting to look at the restrictions. It's important to say, um, to look at the future kind of landscape. And I think we all agree there's huge amounts of uncertainty around when public gatherings will be able to happen again. You know, it may not even be this year. So we thought this is a good way of moving forward. And, and actually, um, this is a good way of reaching different people. You know, most people, not everybody, um, has access to the internet. Um, this is on streamed on YouTube, which you know you don't need to be a member of. So it, we th we think it's a we thought long and hard about how to do this, and we thought stream on YouTube is is extremely accessible. Um, and we hope you guys watching feel, feel the same. So why trial uh, links uh, reintroduction? Why why collect the data for full reintroduction? Um, it's about restoring ecosystems. It's as simple as that. That's that's top and bottom. You know we live in a highly degraded country. The State of Nature report and pretty much everybody agrees with that now. Um, we need to restore our ecosystems. We're finding out very quickly that unbalanced ecosystems are leading to the issues that are affecting everybody's lives. COVID is caused by unbalanced ecosystems and overexploitation of ecosystems. Climate change is caused by unbalanced and overexploitation of ecosystems. We cannot hide from it anymore. It's hitting us right in the face. And restoring ecosystems. Is, a, is, a, is now you know, a, a serious priority for governments all over the world. And links, and no one's saying they're a silver bullet, but they will, they will certainly help to restore balance to our unbalanced ecosystems. Deer numbers, you know, estimates are at least twice what the UK can sustainably carry, at least twice, that's a lot. And that means that there's incredible pressure on, on forests in terms of regeneration. And that's why when you look at, forest you don't see the natural understory and there's lots of talk about planting schemes the planting schemes are not going to work if if the deer numbers are too high there's once once that once the plants get above the tree guard they're going to get nibbled off i mean i've i've seen personally entire new stands of scots pine just decimated in a couple of nights you know hundreds of trees hundreds, you know thousands of tens of thousands of pounds of effort all gone um and the economic benefits are really strong. I mean, again, you know, in the, in the COVID uh, climate, there's been lots of economic issues. Um, rural rural um, deprived areas have been disproportionately hit more. Um, but links are drivers of ecotourism, links are drivers of economic development. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. So, you know, this is about restoring balance into ecosystems. This is about deer control, allowing regeneration. Um, links are also introduced what's called an ecology of fear, where they um, they will take foxes and other mesopredators. predators, um, so they'll actually help ground nesting birds. 
lynx don't prey on ground nesting birds because and it, think about the energetics to a, a roe deer specialist. They want to get um, they want to kill a roe deer, eat the carcass the next five to seven days, and and that's what that's how they generally behave. Um, they're not going to go looking for small woodland birds because it's not ed- energetically worthwhile for them. But they also provide carrion for other birds and scavengers, other birds of prey. Um, so again, it's about these healthy natural ecosystems. This is the way ecosystems should be. It's not. It shouldn't be large trees with a dead understory with nothing in it. That, that is completely unnatural. And when you go to Europe where you've got predators, you don't see the woodlands that you see in the UK. Um, so this is, um, there's lots of in- information and data on this. So there's trophic cascade effect, it's called, where you put in an apex predator and you see an increase in biodiversity. And that's happened um, with the wolf introduction in Yellowstone. And again, you're welcome to go and check these papers out. Uh, most of them can be got free online. But trophic cascades is kind of the, the buzz phrase for um, apex predators and keystone species, of which, of which links are definitely one. Um, other examples are um, sea otters in America, where they went extinct, and then there was issues with urchins overgrazing the kelp, and no one could figure out why the kelp forest were dying. So they put sea they put uh, sea otters back, which are a predator. They're actually quite big, um, and they and they quickly, in a relative space, relative short space of time, cause an increase in kelp forest growth and biodiversity, and and this trophic cascade. So again, it's it's. It's these keystone species. So it talks about the Yellowstone wolf example, where they controlled elk populations and um, led to an increase in forest regeneration. So we had an overbrowsed landscape to a more balanced uh, landscape, which helped animals at all levels. So you get carrion left, you get um, you get reduction in grazing. All these kind of trophic cascade um, web of life links, I guess, that were we're missing in this in this world, especially in our country. Some nice pictures, really. Um, again, very topical. Beavers, different animal, but still a keystone species, just like lynx. Profound ecological changes from a relatively small number of animals. Uh, you know, and I guess most people on this on this um, call on this um, event will will know about um, the beavers that have been released and and that there's actually beaver project plans in in more and more areas now which is which is nice to see and the the, the web of life the the knock-on effect the trophic cascade is um is great again more a couple more journal a couple more papers so you know it's always good to back everything up with scientific um scientific data which you're welcome to take these slides and go back and cross-reference what we're saying with with hard cold scientific data um, a lot of people say that oh, it's, um, who who are skeptical of the project will say oh it's okay we're we're on top of our deer populations we're controlling them well that's simply not not the case um, you know the population is is much higher than than carrying capacity across large parts of the UK um, so there'll be reduced cost of forestry operations to be a lower risk of deer related traffic accidents and also you know I know this is often pitched and as a as a apex predators versus farmers in a, a kind of standoff between conservationists and farmers. Well, that's the exact opposite of the way they should be pitched. Um, so, for example, you know, arable farmers near woodland areas um, will see a reduction in deer in those woodlands, which will help their arable crops. So there'll be a lot of farmers who, who will actually benefit financially directly from, from Lynx. Again, another paper here showing you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, will Lynx really have an impact on on roe deer populations, well, yes, they do. Um, they they reduce productivity. They cause top-down limitation. They increase stress into the population. They increase um, parasite load, and they re- and they increase the intercarving um, period, which slows down population growth. Economic opportunities. So. Um, four years ago, we commissioned um, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, which was very comprehensive, done by one of the biggest ecological consultancies in the world. And they sent people to 
Kielder, they sent people to Harts Mountains and to other places where links are there. And to cut a long story short, and this data, the full report is available um, on our website and we'll put it at the end of this presentation. Um, the potential is enormous. Up to 12.5 million pounds per year based on comparables with your other European areas where this has happened. And these are, these are green, sustainable jobs, training opportunities for young people. I, I remember the first day I was in Kielder um, and I had Links UK Trust sign on the side of a truck and, and um, a young university student came running over and said, thank goodness you're here. Now I can get a job in, in conservation in biology without having to leave the area. And, and that's, never, that's never left me. That, that was, I was, that was a, a, a very poignant moment for me. But, you know, this is about sustainable jobs for local people in the right areas, um, contributing to ecosystem restoration and sustainable ecotourism. And this is some, again, I won't go through all these, but just real life examples of how wildlife, additional species brought into areas, well thought out conservation schemes can generate, you know, multi-million pounds. This is, these are cold hard scientific data this is a spreadsheet of, of the funds generated and and links will be no different uh that's that's beyond doubt the interest as as most of you all know is uh, is huge in in links you know ospreys have been fantastic ospreys are in kielder which is which is great and um, people come to see them and people have a coffee and and watch the cameras and and that that's that's fantastic and that's a success and that success has obviously been done other other areas around the country, but it's a proven it's a proven model. Um, high profile charismatic species generate ecotourism. Ecotourism money for local areas. Just waiting for my um, screen to catch up. Um, again, backed up by scientific data. So. Um, Go through, look at these papers. These papers have got the data that we do we use in, in both in our applications and in our presentations. Um, and and now onto a, a real life case study, a very exciting case study actually, and 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 really tangible. That's the thing. And before we seriously you know, thought about this project, we went to the Harz Mountain in Germany to to look at the actual impact of links on an area, and an area that had no links to now a population of 120. So we wanted to see what this looked like. So the Harz Mountains in central Germany, it's very similar. It looks very similar to, to Kielder, to be honest. It's a similar um, landscape. Um, it's evergreen forest. It's fairly remote. There's not a huge amount. In fact, there's actually more road infrastructure in the Harz Mountains than Kielder. There's actually um, the autobahn bound, binds it on a couple of sides. So um, we sent people to look at, you know, the nitty gritty of why people, how, how are links actually, how important are links? You know, people can say links bring money in. Well, do they really? And how important are they? Well, well, just look at this. You know, lots of people go to the Harz Mountains. And so hiking, landscape, obviously, peace and quiet, obviously. But links were then next, above the visiting of historic sites, above food and drink even, above the cultural history of the area, even above bird watching. Uh, way above winter sports and mountain biking and that that's that shows the power of these animals to bring people in this is why people were coming to the area and and that that again is it's very striking data and uh, it's very powerful data and it, and it strongly points to the ecotourism potential and this is you know some of the numbers that that, that were crunched um the reason why people came to the area and the um the low and high estimates of, of what links can bring in. And you can see the figure of 12.5 million there. Um, and again, the full CBA will, will detail the nitty gritty of that, but I won't go into that now. And when we spoke to lots of people and we did interviews with people um, to collect both qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, and we talked to people why they were there and, and people were talked about just walking through the forest with um, knowing that there's links there. I remember the, we, took, we took a BBC um, film crew with us. We had BBC Breakfast News with us. And uh, the correspondent, there, Graham Satchel, was walking through the forest. And there was a, an elderly couple walking. Um, they were both with the aid of sticks in the middle of the forest. And, and, and the reporter asked them, were they scared? 
and, and he looked at and they both looked at him with a very puzzled look. Does it say, Of course not. That's the route we're here for the chance of seeing a link. And 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 there's lots of there's lots of cases of that. Um, and Bad Hartsburg um, is basically the kingdom of the Lynx. Um, I mean, it's incredible. There's Lynx cable cars, Lynx spas. Pretty much every shop you see sells um, some kind of Lynx merchandise. It's breathed so much life into the area. It's, I mean, it's it's, it's just funny. It's it's like almost like Disneyland for Lynx. It's 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 incredible to see, um, and it's a very exciting place. It's a thriving place. You know, there's there's um, well, links are everywhere. You just can't, you just can't, can't escape them. It's, it's brilliant, and and they're, they're completely welcomed. I mean, they're seen as the the golden ticket. They're certainly not seen as a as a as a curse on the area or a problem. They're they're really embraced, and and to the and and the reason put in. Um, and are now looking at, at doing further introductions in Bavaria. That that should tell anybody that this is. They had no links to 120 links, and now they want more links in separate areas. They're not, they've not wound the project back, they're expanding it. And this is in Germany, no one could argue, is, is very similar in terms of development and economic aspirations and, and, and situation as and, and the UK. Um, this issue comes up a lot, um, and we understand why. And um, we understand there are worries from farmers. There'll be a lot of farmers, I'm sure, watching this, and there'll be a lot of had a lot of questions from people which we'll deal with about about um, impacts on livestock and, and we welcome that, that engagement and like I say we've we have spoke to a lot of farmers in Kielda you know every meeting we held there was farmers present every single one I mean we've even had um, we had senior representatives from the NSA and the NFU come to um, come to meetings and we've consulted with farmers unions they've been given opportunities for both um, written and um, more informal consultations. But the, 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 the cold, hard facts are that across the EU, the kill rate is 0.4 sheep per lynx per year. And this is not our data. This is data gathered from across Europe, from actual compensation scheme payouts, from actual project areas that have links. You know, that's, that's the data. So that works out, a, a lynx kills a sheep on average every two and a half years. Now, nobody can say that's, a, that's a, an in, a threat to the UK livestock industry. Or well, they can't say that seriously, surely. Now, Norway comes up, uh, and you'll see the um, farming unions look, talk about Norway an awful lot. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. It's the exception that proves the rule. In Norway, sheep are herded into the forest. They're not fenced out of it. They are put into it. Where there are wolves brown bear and lynx so it's of course inevitable if you drive link if you drive sheep into a forest where there are predators that um there will be a higher kill rate in norway and you know we don't dispute that uh, but we we question you know whether that that anomaly is is in any way relevant to the uk situation and we would argue that it's not because if you look across the rest of europe um that's the fact and again we have uh, lots of uh, good thoughtful questions about impacts on game species and other species and Dominic will talk about this later on um, but actually there's, there's low direct predation like I said the energetics just don't make sense for something like a lynx to go and prey on on small birds ground nested birds it's just not in its um, it's not worth its while but there's actually an indirect benefit from reduced fox numbers in areas where lynx are both from lynx predating on foxes and also displacing them um, and, and again, we come back to a real project, actual numbers of compensation. So people always ask me about um, compensation schemes and, you know, a compensation pot. And that's a requirement. It'll be a requirement for the license, which we'll deal with. But, you know, um, I'll show you some actual figures of that later. And I think you'll be, you'll be surprised at how low it is. Um, and just again, to put, to put the actual, there's a perception of risk in the farming community, which we understand. But we want to deal with the reality of the risk. And I think there's a, there's a, a meeting somewhere in the middle there. Um, the perception is, is, is not backed up by any scientific facts. Um, so to put it in context, you know, the 739 sheep were, were attacked by dogs in 2012. That figure is probably similar in most, in most years. And if you put that against the average kill rate for lynx, 
you can see that that dogs pose a massive threat to sheep in terms of um, worrying and predation um, compared to lynx. But dogs are everywhere, uh, all over the countryside. And, and well, let us say, let's be clear, you know, we we're, we're as against it. Uh, dogs running off leads in sheep fields than anybody else uh, from welfare point of view. But again, um, let's let's put the, the the impact of links in context against the the mortality backdrop in the UK of of sheep. And again, this is not our data. This is from government official data. And between two and six million sheep per year die of infectious diseases, malnutrition, exposure, and natural mortality. Two to six million. That's a, you know a million, almost a million times more than the risk pay, posed by lynx. Um, so we would we would argue that we understand the concerns, but lynx are not not a threat to the UK sheep industry, especially when you put it against the backdrop of the actual mortality that happens. And so, so also. Sorry, when just going to say also worth emphasizing that we're talking about a trial here uh, with a very small number of animals over five years. So those kind of figures provide the context for a possible future reintroduction. But obviously they are made even more minuscule if we're talking about the five year trial for which the license application will be made. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you, based on, on the extrapolating the figures, you're talking literally a, a handful of, of sheep over, over that time um, based on, on, on average out figures. But let's look at, you know, a, a, an area where there has been a reintroduction uh, of 120, animal, 120 animals now at least. Um, and look at the conversation figures. So it works out about six to seven euros per lynx, the cost. Six hundred forty-two pounds in two thousand thirteen for one hundred and twenty links, but those same links brought in twelve point five million quid. So when you start looking at the economics of this and the opportunities, um, they far outweigh the ri the risk, you know. And that's that's how um, this license application should be judged. So I mean, you know, very go and feel free to to verify these facts. But these are these are actual facts from an actual. Links project. So, as you as you'll know, it was well documented. Um, we um, submitted a previous application, and at that time, we'd carried out the largest species reintroduction consultation ever with the public consultation response of nine thousand six hundred and fifty or whatever it was, with ninety two point eight percent support. I mean, unprecedented. Um, that license was had come on the back of up 12 months of local consultation. A lot of you will have seen us around. Um, uh, we had lots of meetings, um, all documented. Um, we met lots of people. We gathered lots of views, both positive and negative. And we had letters of support from broad cross-section of the community, which was submitted into the license, you know, from local businesses, from local people, from local interest groups, demonstrate um, the, the local support in the area. And we had... Uh, 700 square kilometers of landowner access signed off, which again is unprecedented for, for a reintroduction project. So we put the license in and, and we know what happened. Um, it was the first ever application submitted. The first ever Lynx license submitted in the UK. It went to the Secretary of State, Michael Gove. It went to cabinet level in the government. Um, so again, some people say, oh, this isn't serious, this isn't taken seriously. Well, it's taken very seriously indeed. You know, I was personally invited down to Westminster to discuss this project. And it's, it's worth saying that no other species license has ever gone to this level. This is, this is you know, we take this seriously, we take this responsibility seriously, and, and this, the, our plans are taken seriously by, by a government level, which is good and right and proper. However, um, the decision, which you'll know, was a rejection in November 2018 by Michael Gove. The day before the big Brexit vote was planned and Michael Gove then ran for um, Prime Minister. However, the rejection, there was a, a, a strong discordance between the actual application and the letter. In fact, we responded publicly and, you know, it's all available um, online. Michael Gove's response, Michael Gove's rejection and our response is, is easily available online. 
and and we highlight the the kind of disparity between the, between the two. Um, but you know that that that's what happened. We got the rejection. We we accepted it, and we've um, and we want to to move on from that and and to resubmit, which is obviously why we're talking to you now. But obviously, and you know, we would have liked to, re, to resubmit a lot a lot earlier. We had Brexit, so to put it in context, I think there was three changes in Secretary of State during during about a fourteen month period. So it was difficult to know even to, who to even engage with. Um, there was even a general election. And we, we didn't know which government was going to be in. And we didn't know which cabinet to minister to address. And then, of course, COVID. And, you know, we're all sick of hearing about COVID, so I won't say any more about that. But um, obviously, both those issues have, have led to um, delays and, and frustration on for this project and also a myriad of other projects on, across all sectors. But what is interesting is, without doubt, it's beyond doubt, isn't it? Our world, the world, has changed almost beyond recognition. Um, when we put submitted our license, climate change was talked about, but it certainly wasn't anywhere near the profile it is now, and the, the urgency wasn't there. The loss of biodiversity wasn't front page news. It is now. It's everywhere. It's now seen. You see government, uh, you see heads of governments across the world talking about it, it as the most important issue, the most important issue. Because they're tying that link between biodiversity and health and economic prosperity. You know, we had, we, we had Greta, who's done a great job in raising climate change, huge um, momentum generated by the climate change movement. We've had organizations like Extinction Rebellion who have been born out of this. Um, you know, even Attenborough, the, a lot of the previous BBC documentaries beautifully filmed, and, and was, but they, they would finish with a close-up of a nice animal. Now they finish with how the animal is being protected and how the animal is on the verge of extinction. Because people, the TV commissioners are realizing that the public psyche has changed. Our, our world has changed. And we are inextricably linked to the natural world around us. It's without doubt, we do not live outside of it. And there's an urgency now. I wasn't there. You know, We've even had Boris Johnson talking about an increased number of nature reserves, which I never thought. I'd see, which is obviously brilliant. And like I say, links are not a silver bullet, but they can certainly help to mitigate climate change effects because they will build, help us build healthy ecosystems. You cannot have an ecosystem without epic predators. You just simply can't argue that you can. It's impossible because of the overgrazing and the imbalance. Tree planting schemes without apex predators are deemed to just effectively become deer food. And there are potentially billions of pounds be wasted and billions of pounds of opportunity. And it's against this, this change in political and public psyche and mood that we make our resubmission. The second license is, is imminent. A lot of work has gone into this um, by me, Dominic, and, and a lot of other people who were not on this call, but who, who worked behind the scenes on the project, who were very grateful to. Now, there was actually no real expectation that the first license will, will succeed. You're not going to get the first links license. It doesn't matter if we have ticked every single box um, in the IUCN guidelines and above and beyond it. We wouldn't have got a license. It can't be seen as um, too easy. And there's a political element to this and a, and a process to go through. And, and also what was really interesting was and everybody was learning. It hadn't been done before. There was no um, template license for us to look at. We were learning, the government agencies were learning, some of the conversations and meetings we had with, with Natural England, you know, the, the, it was no one, it was difficult. There was no, um, no previous case study to look at. However, we got the feedback, which we're very grateful for, from, from both Gove and Natural England. Um, and we've addressed the majority of points already raised by Natural England. And we're now completing the final elements. And this, this um, local conversation, is, is part of that. But like I say, our license will be submitted against this public landscape and political landscape that has changed beyond all recognition. It really has. You know, the chair of Natural England, Tony Juniper, has publicly said that the reintroduction of the inspiring wild links would help keep deer numbers down and restore ecosystems. Well, that's exactly what we were saying four years ago when we put the license in. Um, also said, is, is, 
see the links which has been missing from the UK for 300 years reintroduced as part of this of his organisation Natural England's nature restoration plans and that's that's very welcome and, and, and right and proper in our opinion and also interestingly lynx are recolonizing europe on their own so lynx are now turning up in holland and belgium now holland is is very densely populated there's very wild places in holland um belgium again very densely populated but lynx are, are recolonizing and there's no panic there's no knee-jerk reactions the lynx are not being driven out the lynx are not being culled they're actually welcomed there's a huge amount of excitement about it there's a huge amount of, of, of news where we're contacted. I think I've had four media requests from Holland talking about, about links. And there's massive excitement in the country that, that they're, they're proud that their country is actually wild enough to have links back. That's, not, that's, that's so nice to see. But again, these are, these are real life examples of links turning up, not causing problems and being welcomed by both local and at the local and national level. So um, what are the major differences and improvements between this license and the, and the next one? And the, and the, the big one is uh, the HRA, um, which I will let Dominic speak about now. You want me to speak about it now? Yeah. Yeah, please don't. Yeah. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the start, uh, the, under the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations, um, which implements the Habitats Directive, the European Habitats Directive, there is very special protection afforded to, there's effectively a, a tiered set of designated sites in this country with sites of international importance at the top. Now they include SPAs, which are special protection areas, special areas of conservation, SACs, and Ramsar sites, which are an international designation under a separate convention, but which are treated as the same for the purposes of uh, the conservation regs. Um, one of the things missing from the previous application, uh, according to Natural England, was a habitats regulations assessment. Now, it's probably worth emphasizing here that I'm not sure that anyone ever really felt that there was a risk to any of these designated sites. This was just a procedural box that hadn't really been ticked. Um, so we came in to effectively produce this assessment for, for the Lynx Trust. Um, and that involved defining the project area, which you can see outlined in red there, um, with a possibly some amendments still to be made to that. Um, and effectively looking at all of the designated sites within that area and all of the sites within potential range of effects outside that area. So we accept that we are not going to put a fence around that project area. It is going to be a virtual barrier whereby if any links would choose to leave the project area, it would need to be recaptured uh, if it didn't come back of its own accord. And, and ecologically, there's no good reason for them to want to leave. That project area has been drawn for good reason to encapsulate all of the habitat that a lynx is likely to want to use. So, and given that we're talking numbers way below the carrying capacity of Kielder, uh, there will be no incentive for links to want to leave that area, but you, are, you can never say never. So there are contingencies in place for if that were to happen. And we have to, as part of the habitats regulations assessment, consider the possibility that the links could leave the project area and enter one of the designated sites outside it. So we've looked at all of these designated sites and we've looked at whether they have features that could be vulnerable to negative impacts from links. Um, so we have various special areas of conservation in that area, the border Myers special area of conservation, primarily designated for habitat reasons. And so there is no real credible scope for links, particularly during the trial phase with the small number of animals concerned to have any significant effect, positive or negative, really, um, on that site. And that applies to most of the sites, either within or within range of the project area. The sites where we've had to look at a, a bit more closely uh, include the Langholm Castle, Newcastle and Hills SPA, where there are species, bird species that nest on the ground, like hen harrier. And obviously, uh, a hen harrier nest is something that could conceivably be at risk from a lynx that left the project area and entered that site. Um, but again, by effectively looking at the assessment in terms of measures of risk, probabilities, and what have you, 
um, we have been able to come to a conclusion that there is no genuine risk to the adverse effects on integrity, uh, of risk of adverse effects on integrity of that site. And that is the kind of statutory test, if you like, um, that's set out in the regulations. So the key points in relation to habitats regulations assessments are that we're dealing with a very small number of animals restricted to a huge project area. Um, and that of itself massively reduces the possibility that there could conceivably be any effects on any of these sites. Um, but taking a worst case approach, we've assessed all of these risks and we've concluded that none of them really amount to anything significant. Um, for some sites, there is no credible risk at all. For other sites, there is a credible possibility of a risk, but it is absolutely minuscule and can't possibly affect the integrity. We've taken that down to the next tier as well, and we've looked at the impact on non-international sites, so sites of special scientific interest, um, and reached the same conclusions. Um, and in respect of uh, potential impacts on other protected species, again, for the same reasons effectively that we're dealing with a small number of animals over a five year trial period, um, there is no conceivable risk at population level. Um, and effectively, that's where we've got to with that assessment process. And as I say, I don't think Natural England or anybody else genuinely believe that there was any other possible conclusion to that assessment process, but they seem to set a bit of stall by the fact that there wasn't a formal document to show that we'd been through that process or Paul had been through that process in, at, the, at the time of the previous application. So that's now been remedied. Back to you, Paul. Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. So, um, yeah, as, as Dominic rightly said, um, we initially um, applied for six links, and that would have been two, ma two males and four females. Um, we're now going to reduce that to only three links, and that will be one male and two females, and that is to replicate um, the natural kind of breeding structure. So these animals, generally, it's one male with overlapping territories with multiple females, similar to a lot of other cat species. Um, and, and I'm often asked as well, will these animals be able to breed? Um, yes, they, they won't be neutered. Um, they will be able to breed. Um, but as you know, with only three links, there's, there's a very, there's, there's no chance of a, of a inverted commas population explosion or anything like that. If there is any growth, it'll be very slow. Um, and, but we want to, we need to look at intact non-neutered animals because we need to look at the natural behavior this is the point of the trial if we put in neutered animals or even three males or three females that's an unnatural situation and those animals would actually wander further in search of mating opportunities um, so we would be actually gathering false data so the idea of this is to collect natural data from a natural system uh, and that's what we're doing so that's why there's three links and that's why there's a skewed sex ratio to, to females. Um, what's been really good is since we did this, there's been a lot of scientific interest. You know, every so often a paper pops up. Um, there's research done by a few different universities around this, and which is brilliant. And the more people looking at links, the better, because there was very little of it being done when, when we first started our, our work. So it's great. And we often get contacted by masters and PhD students about data and getting involved and, and that's, that's brilliant. So a very recent paper by Johnson and Greenwood, 2020, so very recent indeed. And that showed that um, Kielder is, is a fantastic site for, for links and this is published in scientific um, literature. It shows that it's got over 90, uh, around 90% 90 population viability in the long term, which is again, fantastic. Um, and that, that builds on other work, an earlier work done by Hetherington et al, 2008, Again, all available online. Just look at those links. And you'll see that the Southern Uplands, of which Kielder is obviously a, a key part, could sustain at least 50 um, links. And that was done in 2008. And since then, the deer numbers are much higher. So actually, that could be revised uh, upwards um, significantly. So the Southern Uplands, of which Kielder is a part, is, is a very viable place for, for links. You know, you've got good forests going all the way through Dumfrieshire and Galloway. Um, and yeah, it's it's Kielder is is a is without doubt the scientific literature is saying, and and our initial scoping projects that we did for five years ago show that Kielder is is arguably the best site in the UK for for 
starting to look at links. So the organisations uh, strengthen. We've got um, very pleased to have uh, Dominic involved in terms of giving advice. We have other people giving us advice in terms of legal um, help in terms of navigating the legislation around all this. We have a lot of volunteers who are ready and willing to go. We have some really keen people uh, involved in environmental education who are who are desperate to to go and talk to young people and, and get them excited about conservation. And we've had three years of increased awareness. This is the thing. When we started out, it was seen as a bit way out there. It was a bit like the, the country isn't ready for this. Um, but it is now. It seems to be that you know the, the mood has is, is changed a lot, as evidenced again by even the head of Natural England uh, being positive about links. And um, so all that awareness is is very positive and encouraging. Um, and also, we welcome this as well. You'll have probably seen there's other conservation organisations, and you know some of them quite traditionally conservative conservation organisations looking at linked consultations. That that is fantastic. That we. We're, we're delighted with that. It shows that there's other organisations who are who are realising this is this is a good thing to look at. This is certainly merits further consultation, further work. So, the more people doing research on links, the more people looking at consultation, the more people gathering data. The scientists, that's that's brilliant. You can't ask for better than that. That's superb. So we welcome other other groups. Um, you know, it's not we're not a territorial organisation, um, unlike the links. Um, we want we want other people and other groups to be involved and interested in this. This is a huge um, national issue, and and yeah, it's brilliant. But you know, generally we want we want this to this ha not that we want it to work. Actually, it has to work for the people of Kielda. It has to, you know, um, the kingdom of the links. Why can't Kielda become the kingdom of the links in the UK? Why can't it celebrate these animals coming back? Why can't it create jobs for young people? Why can't the derelict youth hostel next to the primary school in Kielder, which always saddens me, why can't that be redeveloped for accommodation? Um, the, the grant system in the UK is widely publicised. It's going to change dramatically in terms of farm subsidies. I mean, dramatically. And the environmental grants are going to be the way forward for farmers you know, links will help with that. Links will feed into that uh, and provide opportunities for environmental grants. And they'll also help with tree planting as well. <clears throat> um, so green sustainable jobs feed into environmental grants. Um, we've already got letters of support from a good number of local businesses, which which is brilliant. And there's there's some businesses in the area who've been very very supportive all the way through, which which is which is great. Um, and if you are a local business owner. In, in the area and you know you want to look at future opportunities then get in touch with us we want to work with you we want to speak to you we want to know what your ideas are you might have ideas we haven't thought about you might have you might want to develop linked products you might want to develop sustainable ecotourism you might want to um there's, there's a million ways you can do it as we showed in in, in the in the, in the hearts mountains examples are literally an infinite number of ways of um, of generating business if you're a local person who wants to volunteer Great. I spoke to three people this week uh, who, who, since they saw this, um, have offered to volunteer for the project, which is superb. And they're, they're speaking to other local people, and, it, and, it, and it's great. There's a, a nice groundswell of interest and excitement, which is superb. And if you want to send us any, any other questions, then you've got a Facebook page. Um, I'll put up our email afterwards. Um, and there's going to be a second consultation event coming up shortly as well. People always ask, how can you get involved? Well, first of all, go to our website and it's very easy how to contact us on there, linkuk.org. There's a very simple contact form to submit and, we, and we, we try to answer every every message that comes in. It's very important to us. Or you can email us at admin at linkuk.org. And again, we try to answer. We get a lot of emails, as you can imagine, but we try to answer as many as we can. Um, and we always prioritise um, emails from people in, in, in the Kielder and Northumberland area because this is where the project is is going to be. So we've talked um, for an hour, um, which is what we plan to do. We've covered a huge amount of information and, you know, there's a huge amount of further research available for people who are, who are interested in this. But but I guess this is this is where the actual 
consultation we, and because of covid obviously the, the interaction bit has happened before the events in in many ways so we ask for people's uh, questions we ask for people's um views and we've had a fantastic response i mean we'll go through the questions now and we'll go through every question we've been given um and there was a lot we expected a hand we expected maybe 10 15 we got around 50 and some of them overlap so forgive us if, if we refer back to previous answers but we will address the questions that you've given us some people um put their names on some people are anonymous we understand that that's absolutely fine but all these questions have come in through our through this consultation event. So again, um, I, had, I had some, there were some people, um, I had a small media um, piece today about people not access to the consultation and not being engaged or local people not being involved. Well, you'll soon see that there's plenty of questions here from, from the local community, which is absolutely fantastic and exactly what we wanted to happen. So um, we've grouped some livestock farming questions together. Um, and so, Alison mentions about conflict. And again, I think that that word conflict is has been created by the media, really. Um, you know, we, we want to work with farmers to mitigate any risk, although the risk is, is minuscule. We want to mitigate any risk. And there'll be um, compensation schemes that will be part of a key part of our license application. There'll be other mitigation um, techniques that we can use. We're looking at um, guard animals, for example, which are used widely across, across Europe for great success. Um, Dominic's also talked about the fact that actually these animals are not going to be, even if they wanted to, be allowed to interact with livestock and leave the projects area. In the Kielder Forest, there isn't, there isn't livestock grazed in the actual forest. Um, so the, there's not a an overlap between these animals. And, and you won't see a lynx running out over open moorland. They're of woodland specialists. So I think a lot of the, the issue, the perceived issue is diluted by the fact that lynx and sheep don't overlap. You know, an upland sheep farm is not a, is not lynx habitat. So I think, again, it, there's a lot of, obviously a bit of fun in the media. They need a, a kind of, there needs to be this kind of conflict created for it to be a story. But I think in reality, there isn't. And, and what's interesting is in Germany is um, you can see how low the conversation rates are. We showed that previously, you know, six, seven hundred euros a year. But also there's no there's no farmers up in arms. There's no an, animosity. There was at the start. There was concern at the start, but, but there isn't now. Um, so, you know, hopefully we're dealing with the questions about conflict um, that we want. It, but if there is any livestock loss, of course, we want to compensate. Well, then these links will be GPS collared. And that's something that I should have mentioned earlier. These, link, these, these links will be fitted with state-of-the-art GPS collars. They'll be monitored to within an inch of their lives. We'll know where they are all the time, what they're eating, where they're going. Um, that's the whole point of this. So if uh, we'll know if a link leaves our project area straight away. And if someone has a, has a livestock code, we'll be able to check whether our links were actually at that site. And when it was at that site, and does it correspond with the dead, with the dead livestock? And, but as as we've just seen, you know, between two and six million sheep die um, from other causes every year. Any, anyway, um, but we'll be able to cross-reference our links movements with any livestock claims, and if they overlap, and if it's if the evidence is clear that links uh, kill livestock, we will of course compensate because we want to. We we want to. We don't want to damage anyone's anyone's livelihood or even or even the perception of that so that's actually worth pointing out i think paul as well that you wouldn't have an insurance underwriter if they thought they were going to be paying out hundreds of thousands <laughs> but, but no <laughs> pre pre precisely precisely yeah no it was well publicized that lawyers of london were happy to, <laughs> to underwrite any sheep loss for this because they look at it because as you know insurance companies look at scientific data and the scientific yeah, data is they're, they're, it's just a data crunch you exercise and and the data is, is, is really unambiguous and clear. You know, this is not Norway. Um, this is the UK. And, and the UK farming system is not in conflict with our plans for, for links. Um, so there's a question there about, I'm in support of links. The introduction, how would you prevent links tax on livestock, possibly on other endangered species such as pine martins? So obviously the livestock issue is largely covered off by the fact that 
links are not going to be out on up on sheet fans. And if they do leave the project area, then as Dominic said, they'll be recaptured quickly. And a big chunk of our application, as it was last time actually, is devoted to exit strategies, uh, recapture if required, and all those all those key safety net issues, those assurance issues are, are all in there. And they were last time, to be honest. But maybe uh, Dominic might want to speak about um, the risks on the risks from links to other species. Okay, so meso predators is what we would probably group these into, um, the kind of medium-sized predatory animals um, that might conflict with, or might be perceived to conflict with, uh, or be predated upon by lynx, including species such as pine martins and foxes and, and, and badgers and what have you. Um, well, studies in Europe have effectively shown that uh, these animals can, on occasion, be killed by lynx, but that they make up an extraordinarily small part of the diet uh, for all the reasons that Paul mentioned earlier on. Their focus is roe deer um, and they will effectively only take other species uh, on an opportunistic basis. Um, the one species that does figure slightly more prominently from the mesopredator group um, than the others is fox. Um, and in that context, um, uh, lynx help to rebalance the population again with possible trickle down trophic cascade effects that are beneficial for other species such as uh, black grouse and, and others that are more susceptible to fox predation than they would be to lynx predation. Um, obviously we're talking about a situation here where you would be having a kind of fully stocked out um, population of lynx uh, in Kielder up to its kind of carrying capacity. So we're talking about a theoretical situation post a reintroduction here rather than the, the trial. When you apply it to the five year trial and three animals effectively, um, the chances they might kill one pine martin between them over that five year period. Um, that's the kind of statistical probability that we're looking at. Um, so they really, in terms of the trial, they really represent no threat at all to other uh, species of concern, other wild species of concern. Um, and even in a reintroduction context, species such as the pine martin, they behave differently, they're very arboreal, um, they are not going to be high up on, on the uh, smorgasbord of prey items uh, of a lynx. Uh, the species is designed to catch and kill roe deer, and that's what it wants to do. Um, and whereas other species are taken on occasion, um, you've only got to look at the situation in Europe uh, and in Scandinavia in particular, where uh, healthy lynx populations coexist with healthy populations of species that are in serious trouble in this country or are of conservation concern, such as black grouse and capicelli and, other, and, and others. So I'm not concerned um, about that uh, being a significant environmental impact. Um, we're talking here about rebalancing the system. We're not talking about introducing something that's going to unbalance the system. At the minute, you have a system that's unbalanced by huge numbers of deer with the, the trickle-down effects they have on habitat structure and habitat quality, and that then has negative effects for small mammal populations and other aspects. Um, Links will help to rebalance those systems. So whereas every, every once in a blue moon, uh, a lynx might take a pine martin, the other benefits from a, a full-scale reintroduction would, be, would outweigh that so significantly that it would be uh, actually a net positive situation. But again, I emphasize that in this particular application, we're looking at a trial of three animals in a huge area. Um, so there really is no conceivable threat to uh, any rare or protected species. Thanks, Dominic. So this is um, a, a lengthy um, question and, and statement from, from Dawn in Northumberland, so obviously a local person there. Um, and you know th this presentation will be, again, online, so you'll be able to read it in detail, but there's issues about protecting livestock and um, that the world, um, the last paragraph, these creatures were driven out 1300 years ago for the exact reason that they represent a threat to our livelihoods and interests. That's, that's definitely not true. I'm not backed up by any, any scientific evidence whatsoever. That wasn't the reason why uh, lynx weren't killed out because they threatened people's livelihoods 1300 years ago. They were, they were killed for, the, for their beauty, for their pelts, because they, they were actually providing people with livelihoods and the actual pelt. Uh, the world has not 
not changed um, since 1300 years ago. I, I would I would strongly dispute that. Um, both physically and psychologically, the the world has changed for a huge amount of reasons that we've all, we've already explained. Um, there's obviously questions there about livestock and protection and um, pets. And it's, it's, it's good to talk about pets. So, for example, again, in Germany, a real life example of 120 lynx. You don't see newspaper articles of lynx killed my dog or, you know, walkers getting attacked um, because they're walking around with the Yorkshire Terrier. You just don't see it. And the reason why you don't see it is because it doesn't happen. Um, and I, I, we were, I was at a Lynx meeting once in Thetford and um, a gentleman um, asked me a question about the threat to his dog, his dogs. And I asked him um, which dogs he had. And he had German Shepherds. And I said, how many do you have? And he said, five. And I said, where do you live? And he went, um, just in, in a village. And, and the concept of a, of a lynx going to a village to take one of five German shepherds, again, is, is out with the bounds of, of possibility. But if you're, if you're walking through the forest with your dog, you and your dog are at, at no risk. That, you are, a dog with a human is a terrifying prospect. You know, we're noisy, we're brash, the dog is with that person. Even when the dog is off lead, they don't run miles away from the person. They're normally within earshot, within calling distance. Um, and links will be long gone, long, long gone. So, you know, there's a lot of um, issues in, in this email, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll be dealt with a lot of them there. Um, and, and I take issue and about contempt for the local community well again you know it's just not borne out by by the evidence you, you'll know a lot of you you'll have seen you'll have seen us around a lot um, that doesn't show contempt that shows that we want to speak to you and um, we want to we want you to be involved and we wouldn't get letters of support if if we were acting in a, in a contemptful way we understand that there is some hostility from the farming community we understand that um but you know Believe me, there's none of us hold any contempt for local residents. We're, we're excited to work with you to, um, to develop this project. You're, you're key to it. Um, how This is from Ashley. And Ashley asked I think, four or five questions throughout this, which is great. Um, how are the project funded? Is the main back of the project to remove the funding? It cannot be claimed on government land due to double funding regulations. I'm not sure about the government land double funding thing. We're, we're not, we've never asked for, nor will we ever apply for government funding for this trial release. It's, it's, um, it's funded, it's, it's ready to go. Um, the main backer for the project, um, there wasn't a main backer for the project to remove the support and funding. And our first license was actually, we had so much pro bono support I mean, we calculated it as over two and a half million pounds of pro bono support. Um, and that was actually a real strength of the application. And when we discussed that with Natural England, and we said we actually didn't even need to fundraise because of the level of interest from highly professional people who would offer their support for free, both locally and, and nationally. So, um, yeah, the, the, the question um, about double funding government regulations. We're, we're, we're not applying for land subsidies. We're not applying for land grants. Uh, and, the, and the funding is not taxpayers' money. It's from, it's from private people, philanthropists, uh, who, are, who are interested in, in habitat restoration, which is, which is brilliant. Um, next one from, from Ashley. Um, how do you expect to get the support of local landowners, farms, and local residents? Are, are they fully, after they fully opposed the scheme previously? Uh, again, they didn't fully oppose the scheme um, previously and the letters of support from local residents in Keeler Village and surrounding areas um, support that. How do you justify the way you incorrectly completed the consultation last time and incorrectly reported you had spoken of visited to all local landowners, farms and local residents? I mean, we, we, we didn't claim to speak to, I mean, you know, no one's going to say even on during this phase of conversation that we're going to speak to everybody. It's not possible. Um, a lot of people... Some people are interested, for example. Some people don't want to engage in the project. They don't, they don't care. Um, they've got other things to worry about. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not, we, we can't reach every single person. We can, we can try and reach as many people as possible. And, and 
and that consultation must be genuine and inclusive. And we've done face-to-face -face visits, and now because of COVID, we're doing online um, online consultation, which actually would probably reach other people who, who couldn't be bothered or didn't want to come to the face-to-face -face meetings because um, you know childcare or whatever else. So this is part of an inclusive consultation. But in terms of incorrectly completed the consultation, just on that point. There is no way to incorrectly complete the consultation. It's not right or wrong. It's about demonstrating that you've you've consulted and that you've gathered views and that those views have informed your application. And that was done last time, and it will be done this time as well. And we'll but we'll we'll make it more explicit to Natural England how how we've done it. Like I say, everyone was learning last time, us and the government. Um, this from Fiona Northumberland again. Two questions from Fiona, which is great. Uh, why are you pushing to reintroduce an animal that was last native to this country over a thousand years ago? Surely the world's a different place, let alone Northumberland. It is not a native environment that they would be introduced to, but a man-made working forest. I fear it's an experiment that would be put in the lives of these the magnificent animals at risk for a trial. Thank you for your time. Okay, an interesting question there for Fiona, and, and there's three or four issues in that, and, and, and the good issues to raise. So we've never said, nor would we say, that Kielder is a, is a, is a native forest. It's a plantation forest. It's a commercial forest. Uh, largely of Sitka, although there are, there are some nice areas, of, as, as some of you will know, local people know more than me, there's some really nice deciduous woodland there, and there's actually some really encouraging deciduous planting going on in, in Kielder, which is great. Um, but this, this man-made working forest is, is full of deer. Uh, it densities up to 11 or 12 per square kilometre of road deer. Um, and a lynx doesn't look at a tree and think, is it native or non-native? Links assess deer density and links hunt deer. So, um, sick plantations are actually very good for deer and host large densities of deer. So, the good places for, for links, and again, other feasibility studies that have been done um, looking at Scotland and the rest of England, plantation forests form a big part of the available habitat. So it's certainly not putting the lives of these magnificent animals at risk. None of us would do that. Um, Kield is, is as, as the recent paper by Johnson and Greenwood shows, is, is the premier site for lynx in, in, in England. Um, but no, good questions. And then you raised some interesting, interesting points there. So thanks, Fiona. And then another one from Fiona. Was the Eurasian lynx the type that was native to the UK all those years ago? Absolutely, yes. Um, from, the bone, um, from the bone records I talked about earlier from braver people than me, um, these were Eurasian lynx, and you'll know a lot of you are informed um, that there's also uh, Iberian lynx that have been the success of a very, uh, very successful reintroductions in Iberia. But we're not bringing back Iberian lynx simply because Iberian lynx weren't, weren't here. These are the Eurasian lynx which were um, part of the UK. And like I say, you know, I say this in interviews all, all the time. There are UK native. There is native as a hedgehog or a blackbird. They are a native UK species. That that's a that's a fact. Um, question from Ashley. Uh, there's another one from Ashley. Um, covers 250 square miles. Your previous state of links were fitted with trackers, and if there was any risk that they would want to leave the forest, would, would you be there to stop it? How do you actually propose you would do that due to the vast area density of woodland? So, again, Dominic has, has correctly said that there's a very strictly defined project area. Um, I myself am, am very experienced in, in animal capture, animal tracking. Um, and these animals are going to be fitted with collars, GPS collars. So if an animal leaves an area, it'll be relatively easy to catch. Uh, and again, lynx are regularly trapped and collared and recaptured in, in Europe for research studies, for translocations. So actually, I'm not going to go into the detail of how you tra trap one for obvious reasons, but um, they, are, they are able to be recaptured. And that's proven um, all across Europe. Um, this is from, from Claire, um, Northumberland again, which is great. My partner works at Kiel the Forest. How would he keep him safe from the lynx? Um, very, very easy. Um, and again, they just come back to facts. So in, I think in human history, uh, there's never been a case of a, a wild lynx ever attacking a human being. And I showed you the earlier slide, one of the first five or six slides about how widespread links are found. They are found literally all over the Northern Hemisphere and beyond. And there's never been a story of a, a lynx attacking, a, per, a wild lynx attacking a person. 
Um, so, so your your partner um, is at literally zero risk. Um, and it, you know, I don't know, if Dominic, whether you want to add, add anything to that, but um... Um, I'll just give you a very quick anecdote. Uh, related species, not the same, but um, I worked in the United States for a little while. Um, on a reserve in the Arizona, uh, Colorado and, and uh, California border. Um, and I was dying to see Bobcat. Um, didn't see it, didn't see it, didn't see it. One of my jobs every day was to open sluices in this reserve. And um, I got a bit blasé about doing that. Nearly got bitten by a rattlesnake one day. One other day, I effectively crashed into a bob Bobcat. Um, and this thing went off at an absolute rate of knots before I'd even realized what was going on. So. If anybody was ever going to be in a situation where they might get clawed or attacked or anything like that, it was me behaving stupidly in that situation. Um, but this thing absolutely haired it off. And I was actually surprised how small it was as well. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if that helps reassure anybody, but there's my little linked related anecdote. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, when, when you see these, like I say, the, just to clarify, that they're not a big cat. Um, they're not a tiger. They're not a leopard. They're not a... A lion, um, and and just on on this on this point, uh, I hear this a lot, and it always makes me smile about um, the media talk, and then a lot of the farming unions talk about packs of lynx, um, marauding packs of lynx, <laughs> which you're going to the vice smile on Dominic's face too, because it's just so far removed from the biological reality. I mean, these lynx are solitary animals, solitary predators. You will never see. Uh, a pack of links. If you do take a picture of it, it'd be worth a fortune to National Geographic and send us a copy of it. You just you just simply won't see them. It doesn't it, it won't they don't exist. So the solitary territorial animals and 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 Claire, please be assured your husband is um your partner is, is very very safe. Um this is um another see the detailed questions from Tarset Ar archive group. So again very local we've done public events in, in Tarset which is which is great. Um there's reference there to an Overdon study um, and about detail modeling and viability and um, Kielder for a sustainable genetic population. So there's lots of questions in there. So first of all, the scientific literature is clear. Um, the most recent scientific data shows that Kielder is the premier site in, in England and one of the best sites when you include Scotland as well. And actually, Kielder, as you all know, is a cross-boundary site, so it's, it does it does um, lead into Scotland too. So you know the scientific literature is clear. Um, I'm not sure. I've not seen the Overdon Overdon um, publication, whether it's peer-reviewed or published, but the the Headington paper and the Johnson and Greenwood one certainly are, and and they're unambiguous, consistent, and entirely clear that um, links is that Kielder is is a fantastic sites for links um responsible ecological so I'm just trying to pick out the, the question there's a lot of lot of sub questions there so I'm trying to get to the so there's something about big enough oh uh, Kielder was not big enough to sustain a genetic it referred back to a previous meeting again evidence that we have done a lot of consultation before um about a genetically healthy population well again as Dominic said a number of times on me this is not we are not creating a, a, a population of links. We are inoculating a, a massive area with three links. So the issue of genetic health at this stage is completely irrelevant. I mean, I'm a geneticist by, by training. I'm a widely published author in, on genetics. I've got a, a paper in, in Nature on genetics. So genetics is a, I'm a geeky geneticist. Um, that's what I love. I love population management. I love um looking at ways of increasing genetic health of endangered populations, that's, that's, that's really uh, floats my boat. But that's, that's a long way down the line. That's if and when the government decide that a reintroduction is, is, um, is viable. So just to cover off that, there are very good questions and there's lots of information in there from Tarsit Archive Group. Um, the scientific evidence is clear on Kielder as a viable site. And, you know, we're not looking at long-term genetic health at this stage because, um, that's simply not what we're applying for. Um, this is from Matt from uh, Northumberland again, which is great. I live locally in support of this project. I understand links have spread in Europe to countries like Belgium and Netherlands. Is that right? How do links coexist long people in density populate countries like these? Um, we, I alluded to earlier um, the issue of 
links Natalie Recolonas in Belgium and the, and the Netherlands, which is which is brilliant. And and you know just Google it and you'll see a lot of excitement and a lot of a lot of um, positive news stories about it. So and as as I said, and it, and it saddens me um, that links would be that we even have to do this. Uh, links would be here on their own if we had a land a land bridge with Europe. They would come through Europe. They would come through France. Um, and how do links coexist alongside people in densely populated countries like this? Well, this this is testament to they do coexist. You know, Germany now in Belgium, Holland. They're already there are a good population in France. All densely populated areas, very comparable to the UK. In fact, you know, Kielde is is much less populated than a lot of places where links. Uh, exist and it's testament to the links the links and its elusive nature the fact that they are forest specialists the fact that they are called the ghost cat so yeah they the they avoid people at all costs is how they do it um but it's nice that they are recolonizing naturally and and we and we wish you know, that that could happen in in the uk but, but it can't this is from this is from Briggy in uh, Northumberland. Are the plans to reintroduce the links in Kiel the Forest? I hope so. Well, yeah, uh, there are plans to introduce a trial a trial release, uh, Briggy. So you know this is this is a three this is three animals at, at this stage, and then we'll collect the data, um, and then there'll be a discussion in five years time or just longer than five years time by the time we get the license in um, about whether there is a full introduction reintroduction into Kiel there. But no, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. And I feel say we. We hope so too, but we're not getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, we're not. I'm not. We're not going to. I'm not going to sit here and say that I don't want links to be reintroduced into the UK. I mean, it would, be, it would be ridiculous and disingenuous. Of course, I believe that links. I'm a scientist. I follow the scientific data. Link. The UK is suitable for links, so links should be here. That that's that's it. Links are found almost all over Europe. Um, to often to great fanfare. So. Of course, we want the full introduction to take place, but that's not what we're applying for, and that's not what we'll, what our application will be assessed on. So, just, everyone just needs to be clear on that. And and you know, a reintroduction is a reintroduction. The trial is fully reversible at any point. At any point. Um, this is from from Matthew. A different, not Matt. This is from Matthew. Will you be paying for the ten foot high electric fence around my animals, keep them safe? Um, no. Um, in in short, um, I don't. I don't know where, where your animals are based or what animals you've got. I, I'm, I'm only guessing you're talking about um, sheep, where we've addressed at uh, length uh, the issue with with livestock conflict and, uh, and the kind of perception versus the actual um, risk. So we don't we don't think it's, it's necessary, but obviously we're, we're happy to come and, and meet you and, and see your farm and, and talk about ways of um, potentially mitigating any risk or talk about ways of, of how we would um, confirm any any livestock predation or how we could track our links, happy to, to tell you how we do it, how we keep track of them, how often we can find out where they are and, and share that information with you. But you don't need a 10 foot high, high fence around your animals to keep them safe. Um, as killer is only 15 miles square at best, then it's 200, I'm not sure about that, 200 square miles, 15 square miles, but anyway. Um, there's a, um, there's a question here about lynx range sizes, which is, which is a good one actually. Um, so lynx territory size is very hugely across Europe. I mean, actually, the maximum given the 150 square miles is actually short. It's actually 200 square miles. Um, well, that's in in very um, far north in Scandinavia, where the prey density is is low to non-existent. So lynx range between 20 and 200 square kilometers, 200 square miles. But it's all to do with density of food. So in Kielder, we have one of the highest densities of deer in, in the UK. And across the UK, deer densities are way higher than across Europe because we don't have predators. So we actually predict that um, the UK will have some of the, the UK links will have some of the smallest territories in Europe because they simply don't need to wander. Uh, migration, tra travel is a, is a serious, is a risky process for links. They have to cross barriers, they have to disperse. And they won't, as Dominic said, they they won't do that if if the if the ecology is right. So um, you know, links three animals in Kielder, uh, there's plenty of food, plenty of space, and like I say, the feasibility study, the population viability analysis done by Johnson and Greenwood and by Hetherington show that Kielder and the Southern Uplands can can comfortably host um, a good number of links. 
And then I think there's a question there about monitoring, um, which is which is great. So yeah, there'll be f monitoring is is fundamental to our project. You know, it'd be pointless to do it without without serious monitoring of these animals. We want to know where they are all the time, and we'll be obsessed with knowing where they are all the time. And and that data will be fundamental to our um, submissions to the government after five years. I know great questions in there. Uh, don't really want to talk, uh, Dominic, about about monitoring or any wider wider issues like that, or you know the the data that we're looking to get for for the government. Well, yeah, it'll it's it's really just as much data as we can get. We want to milk as much we can as we can get from these three animals over that five year period. Where they're going, how they're using different habitats, how they're using different age structures of forest. Um, whether they're staying away from particular areas, um, do they try and leave at any point? I mean, for the reasons that Paul has said, ecologically, that wouldn't make any sense for them to do that. Um, they're going to be in kind of a bit of an, a, an abundant hotspot of prey with, with the right habitat, whereas everywhere outside is going to have, uh, is going to be fairly hostile to them. So um, we expect them to stay put. Um, uh, but all of these things will come out as part of the monitoring and then all of that data can then be crunched, even in terms of the aspects that I'm interested in, particularly uh, this probably the sad fact of, of the only kind of sad downside of using such few animals um, is that we probably aren't going to see the full suite of trophic cascade effects over a five year period. That's that, that that's a bit unfortunate. There's just simply not enough animals to, and not enough time to generate those effects. But we might see some inklings of it around the edges. We might start seeing deer patterns. We might be able to have ancillary studies on deer patterns and see whether we start to detect that landscape of fear that, 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 that Paul was talking about that influences deer behavior and that allows um, uh, forest recovery and habitat recovery to to, to, to to proceed much better. So it's really going to be a case of getting as much data as we can. Uh, and obviously a major purpose of that data is to inform um, the possibility of a future application for a larger scale reintroduction. And, and, and the more informed that future application is, the better for absolutely everyone. Um, so it's not just the, 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 the links to themselves that we'll be monitoring, we'll also be monitoring the economic effects um, and all of the other kind of social effects, the, 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 the attitude of local people, whether that changes over the five year period, whether tourists come in, whether people come in and spend money in Kielder just on the off chance that they might see one of these needle in a haystack, three animals, um, but that won't stop. It won't stop the likes of me going and trying to find them um, and I'll probably still have a damn good time not seeing them um, uh, and I'll probably spend money locally and others will do the same so we want to just collect data on all of those things and they are all going to then be able to, to, to for the government to come to a very informed decision about a full-scale reintroduction whether that's in Kielder or elsewhere. Thank you Dominic. Um, and Pat Patricia um, another question on domestic pets so we covered that a, a little bit um, just on the open moorland bit, um, absolutely, it's completely so you you will not see a lynx running around open moorland. That's you know that's just the way it is. And for the reasons I explained earlier, off leashing forest, absolutely, um, again, infinitesimally small um, risk. You don't you don't see headlines of Yorkshire terriers being taken by lynx in in forest or uh, on or off the leads. So yeah, um, rest easy. You can enjoy your dog walk. Um, in in an area, and the lynx will see you a long time before you see it, and it'll be gone. Um, you are you and your dog, Patricia, with the greatest respect, are a terrifying sight to a lynx. <laughs> you're, you're a scary prospect to a lynx. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, Alison from Northumberland again, another local person. It's great. Whilst I'm in favour of reducing lynx, I'm concerned that further down the line there will be calls for lynx to be called. Can you assure me there are measures in place to stop this happening? Well, um, you know, as I say, this is this is a trial. Um, so we go back to the point and, you know, without reiterating too much what we've already said before, it was boring you. Uh, we're an hour and a half in now. Um, this is three animals. So there'll be no issue with these animals being called. There'll be no issue with these animals um, exceeding carrying capacity of killed and not even close. So, yeah, we can reassure you that there'll be no calls to cull uh, these animals because you cull 
when animals overpopulate. Um, but these animals will also be strictly protected. You know, we will we will insist and expect that they're strictly protected. Um, so you know, not only are they at no risk of culling, but the, the, the risk of persecution is 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 as low as it can be. And and engagement is a key part of that as well as legislation and, and enforcement. You know, we want people to like in in Germany there is an issue with persecution because people love the links. They want more links. There's actually you won't believe it, but there's actually a waiting list for links in Europe. Because there's so many countries wanting to do reintroductions that there's you know people people want them from healthy populations. Um, so yeah, um, no issue with them being being culled. Um, but, but thanks for that. It's good. You're clearly concerned about welfare, uh, which is the same as which we are too. Um, so thank you. This is Ashley again. I'm not sure if it's the same Ashley or a different Ashley, but um, this question welcome. Um, there are no triple SIs within 20 miles of Kiel, which are in poor condition due to deer grazing pressure. Um, I'll ask you about that in a minute, Dominic. But the population of Kiel, deer in Kiel is one of the lowest in the country. Um, it's just factually not true. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid. So, I, you know, I don't want to be blunt, but that statement isn't, isn't true. There are plenty of deer. I I've never met anybody in Kiel who hasn't said there's lots of deer. You know, when you talk about the deer, it's, it's everyone goes, yeah, everyone's got a deer collision story or. You know, a near miss with a with a deer at the side of the road. There are deer everywhere in Kiel, and you only have to spend a few hours there to see evidence of them. And um, if you don't see animals themselves, the evidence is everywhere. Um, but Dominica, you want to talk about the issue of triple? I'm assuming you mean triple S R in yeah. Kiel. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm assuming the source for that statement is probably the online condition assessments um, for triple S I S, which um it may be the case that they don't officially record deer grazing as one of the elements of damage or poor condition uh for any triple si's that, that, that are in poor condition but that that's that that's not a definitive statement that deer is not exerting pressure on important habitats um certainly it's 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 widely known that that particularly in native woodlands um Deer browsing um, has significant effects on um, regeneration and on woodland structure, uh, particularly at high densities. And that applies to dwarf shrub habitats and, and various other important habitats uh, that, that are represented in the Kielder area. So I think probably what, what that is, is, is a deduction from some of the online information on Natural England's website. But I'm not sure it's a, it's a deduction that can actually realistically be made. Um, I think that the facts are that, 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 that deer grazing pressure is a significant factor in Kielder as much as it is anywhere else, which has got high population densities. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Chris, again from Northumberland, why are you saying that links should be reintroduced into Kielder Forest when they were never ever there at any time in Kiel's man-made forest? And there's questions there about insurance and loss of livestock. Um, so I think we've, we've covered both of those um, issues. But, you know, just to reiterate again, you know, it is a man-made forest, but it's great for lynx. Um, but to say that lynx were never, ever there is simply not true. Uh, lynx were found all over the UK. Killed, uh, in fact, the UK would have been around 90% forested, at least, um, in, in previous times, since the last ice age. And lynx and other predators would have been widespread. So it's a you know um, I don't know how old you are, Chris, but to say they're never ever there is a, is a, is a, is a big statement to make. Um, but they, they certainly were in that region and and in in in, border, in bordering areas. There's a lot of um, remains come out of North Yorkshire, for example, um, which isn't a million miles away. So the, yeah, links were certainly in in the northeast. They would have certainly walked the ground of Kielder. Kielder Forest itself is 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 relatively young in the big scheme of things. Um, and there would have been native forest there before, but like I say, lynx don't look at a sitka tree and and see is it native or not. They see the utility, the function of that habitat, and this the functionality of this habitat is fantastic. Lynx, as it is for other species, it's like saying you know pine martins won't use it because it's not native. Well, try telling that to the pine martins if you put them in there. You know, it's it's, it's just simply animals do not assess. They don't have an ecological snobbery. They look at the utility of a habitat, the functionality, and and Kielder is is stonking for lynx. And, you know, there's no there's no question about it, and that's backed up by by the scientific um, studies. But thank you, uh, good question, good issues. Um, Jane, 
Northumberland again, local brilliant. Uh, why are you consulting when you've already been told no? The majority of local people do not want links introduced. They never have been here before. So we've covered they've never been here before. Again, big statement to make. Um, I don't know how long you've been around, Jane, but um, you know that's a, that's a bold statement to make, and it flies in the face of, of the facts. Um, we've been told no. So we our, our application was rejected, and that's very different from being being told no. Um, our application was rejected with feedback, and uh, the feedback is there to inform, obviously, further applications. And since then, the head of Natural England has come out uh, with the quotes that we've already said, which have been widely publicised in, in pretty much every national newspaper. Um, so we're consulting because we're required to consult and we want to consult. We're required to consult by the IUCN reintroduction guidelines and we want to consult because we want you guys as many people as possible to be on site. And again, the majority of local people do not want links introduced. In our experience, that's simply not true. There are people who don't want them introduced and, or, and most of those people are, have a farming connection and we understand that. But when you speak to people in other sectors, local businesses, um, when you speak to young people who want jobs in the area, that is, your statement is, is just not true. Um, but our job is to get as many people as possible behind, but this is not a referendum. This is not a vote on how many people want it and how many people don't. This is about making a case for a trial release. Um, and and that, that's, the, that's all it is. It's, it's worth adding to that. It's, it's even, the, even the skeptics, even the people who are diametrically appro- opposed to this as an idea, surely it is in everybody's interests for a trial to take place um, that will establish whether the concerns uh, that are being expressed by, by, by some comment, commentators here, whether they are founded or whether they are unfounded, um, and whether the optimistic look uh, at the issues that the likes of Paul and I take, whether they're founded or unfounded as well. It's in everybody's interest to try and establish. I mean, there's, there is a general consensus that rewilding type initiatives such as this and rebalancing ecosystem um, are, are the future uh, and are a good idea. And they help with climate change. They help with um, human well-being and all sorts of other related issues. They help with it, with the with the economy. There's just been a report released released that that, that establishes that there needs to be an economic um, there needs to be an economic element to wildlife conservation and that that needs to be better recognised. So the way things are moving is in that direction. And, and, and Paul mentioned uh, the chair of Natural England effectively saying the reintroduction of links is a good idea in principle. Um, so it is in everybody's interests to allow a trial to take place that establishes are the concerns real, where they're real, what can we do about them to mitigate those concerns, are the benefits real, um, all of those kind of, all of that, and that's what we're hoping to achieve, all of that kind of the data that will come out of this trial will give answers to a lot of the questions that are being put here. And then we will, we will know whether we're right or wrong and the people who think it's a really bad idea will know whether they're right or wrong. And then that, that's surely in everybody's interests. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. I think that's, that's, a, that's a good way of summing it up, really. Um, a question here at the bottom. Doing a consultation this way is not fair. The internet connection for those living in the area of Kielder is, is very erratic. Um, why won't you take no for an answer? So um, on the internet connection issue, well, you know, these, a lot of these emails have come from people uh, locally. Uh, we've had a lot of engagement on Facebook from people locally. We've had a lot of contact with people locally. And again, this is not the only consultation that we've done. And it's not the only consultation, consultation that we will do. Um, but, pe- but, you know, the Kielder area, people have um, internet connection, clearly as, as evidenced by, by the level of interest. Um, and the number, there was a lot of people showing interest in attending the, the this event i'm not sure how many people have, have logged in but there was a high number expressing interest which showed they had the internet connection to be aware of that so so you know we don't um accept that criticism this is one one element of a suite of consultations we've already done a lot of face-to-face and we would do face-to-face if we could believe me but we would also do online because it, it, it hits everybody um so we think this is actually and, and streaming it on youtube is about as accessible as you can get so um yeah, and and this is not the only consultation uh, that will occur. Um, 
So from anonymous again about um, forests of farmland. Why should we have the worry of wild links near sheep, lambs, calves, bulls, hens, pets, etc.? When the proposal was clearly rejected only recently. So we've we've covered the why we think the the, the dynamics have changed, and actually Dominic summed it up perfectly better than I did about um, you know whether you're for or against why a trial should occur. Um, calves, Mr. Calves again. I mean, just to put this in context: the size of a lynx. If you've got a um, a heifer with a calf next to her, um, that's, again, that's, that's a lynx is not even going to contemplate contemplate that. We've covered pets, um, hens. Again, you know, hens in hen houses near properties, uh, no place for no place for a lynx to um, to go. Um, and then this is from India in Yorkshire. If a lynx introduction does go ahead, how will the potential for human conflict be mitigated, especially in regards to local landowners like farmers? Again, we've talked about um, link, human links conflict. We've talked about um, we want to be a genuine and accessible compensation scheme. We want to talk about mitigation. We want to talk about share information about how we will monitor these links to address any claims so it's all transparent. Um, but thank you for that, Indian. A follow-up question for India. Given the hugely charismatic species, is there potential for eventual ecotourism? Absolutely, yes, as we've covered. So I won't elaborate on that. But you know, look at the Harz Mountain stuff, and look at what's what's happened over there, and and hopefully you'll be you'll see this clear and strong evidence about about the ecotourism about the eventual ecotourism potential. And as Dominic said, we don't know how quickly that will happen. But uh, if I was to tell you that. Even before links have arrived in Kielda, I know people who work in the tourism industry who are saying people are coming to see the place where links will go. So that's the interest in it already. People think it, it adds to this while, and this is an important point we haven't said, you know, Kielda is becoming known for dark skies as a, as a wild area, and links feeds into all that. It doesn't work against it. It adds to the, to the atmosphere of the place. It's from Anonymous. I'm very excited about this project. Will local people be able to find out how the links are doing or get any updates after they are released? Absolutely, yes. Um, dissemination is a key part of the IUCN translocation guidelines, how to engage and inform communities and on a national level. So there'll be, there'll be constant updates about this project. Obviously, we'll have to be careful about the location of the links, and that will be um, kept under wraps for very clear and obvious reasons. But in terms of how the links are doing, any breeding events, um, any interim reports. There'll, you know, there'll be a 12-month um, report produced about how things are going, and there'll be constant analysis of of changing attitudes. And as, as again, what Dominic talks about the monitoring. So yeah, there'll be a, you'll be you'll be drowned in data and information about these links, um, and and that's great. And that's what's happened on other other projects. Um, Anonymous, who runs the Links UK Trust, which science is currently working with or for the trust? What's the background and experience? Do you have any external partners in academia? So there's been loads of people who have fed into this application. I'm a scientist. I've got, um, I was a, a senior lecturer for eight and a half years in conservation biology. Um, we've worked with a range of advisors, scientists, external partners, from lawyers to insurance people to professional ecologists, people who work in education, um, people who work in enforcement, people who work in human animal um, conflict. We spoke to partners, uh, people in other countries who've lived with links. We've sent consortiums of people um, from other consultancies to go and speak to people who live with links in other areas. So a huge amount of in, of, of collective um, effort and experience has gone into the first application and, and all, and that's been built on for the second one. So, so yeah. Um, and again, what, what I will say is um, if anyone does want to be involved as any, any academics or any research biologists or any local people who want to, are interested in conservation ecology, then, then get in touch. Um, you know, this is, like I say, this is not, we're not a territorial exclusive organization. We want people uh, from a range of backgrounds and, and you know, answer your question. You know, almost any background can add to this project because this is a holistic project. This is not just about um, putting animals into a forest. There's the whole socioeconomic issue to, to look at as well. Yeah, good questions. Um, assuming, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't, know if it's worth, I don't know if it's worth adding there, Paul, that 
for people to get involved and to help. They don't need to be ecologists. They don't need to be cat specialists. They don't need to be wildlife nuts if they are um, interested in assisting on other matters uh, such as data collection, data processing, all of those things. It, that, that there's probably a place for anybody um, in, in terms of making this work over the five year period. Absolutely, and and that's and you know that's regardless of, of age or fitness or anything like you know you don't have to be able to run up and down hills to travel. You know, there's loads of different ways you can get involved. So yeah, that's it. An, an important an important point to make. Um, let me just uh, sorry, I'm I'm losing my voice a little bit. One second. Okay, so um, <clears throat> assuming you've seen the research that used simulations of linked populations to predict reintroduction outcomes and concluded kill, there's only 21% chance of long-term success. I think in size 83, is there a reason Keel would prefer to Kintyre? So again, I, I don't I don't know the 21% chance success um, paper that that's in. I can only refer you to the most recent paper, which is published, um, peer-reviewed, and that showed 90% population viability long-term. And, and in terms of Kintyre, I know Kintyre potentially well. Um, Keel has, has much bigger continuous uh, forest blocks, so I would argue that that Kielder as a, as a as an entity is is much um, more viable than than Kintyre. and also deer densities are very high. Roe deer are very high in um, Kielder. They're certainly higher than they are in Kintyre. Again, we've actually scoped out uh, Kintyre. We did a lot of work scoping out Kintyre and other parts of Scotland as well. Um, is there any legal difference in England versus Scotland? Um, obviously, there's there's the devolved government in Scotland. Um, this, this application will go to Natural England. That's important to to uh, know. But S, uh, Nature Scott, formerly SNH, will obviously be consulted and have aware of this. And and, and you know, uh, Dominic and I and other members of the team have, have been on calls with uh, members of Nature Scott about about links in Scotland and about our, our plans for Scotland and and informing them about where we are on our Kiel application. And and Nature Scott will be will be fully um, involved in. I'm sure they'll be consulted by Natural England, which is absolutely right and proper. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, legal difference, we're all they're both under the same kind of high-level legal obligations, um, and and both parties, both Natural England and Nature Scott, actually both um, assess applications using the same criteria, which is the IUCN translocation guidelines. Hope that answers that question. Um, what is the predation level for mesa predators such as fox and badgers from lynx? Um, Again, Dominic comprehensively answered that um, issue of meso predators, and you know they, they, they fox and badger do feature in the diets, particularly fox. We've covered that one, but thank you uh, for that question. It's a good one. I'm in support of a link to introduction. However, we would how would you prevent attacks on livestock and possibly primates? Again, that's related to the um, one above, which Dominic's comprehensively talked about. But thank you for for a very important. Uh, and there, are there any plans to link habitats on nature reserves between countries, e.g., England and Wales? Listen, uh, Robert, uh, great question, and, and big and a big picture question, a uh, bigger picture question than, than our project actually. Um, but what you know, I think Dominic will will certainly back me up on this. That we're 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 very keen on on linking up areas of habitat, creating corridors, creating networks of woodlands, sensible, well thought out planting schemes that maximize um, maximize resources and, and effectiveness. So yeah, um, where we're really keen on on linking habitats to create bigger space for nature. And like I say, you know, even the Prime Minister himself is is now talking about planting trees, which which is great. Um, Lindsay in Sussex, if you're introduced links to Britain, how many females or males will be there? Uh, again, good question. Um, but again, we're not reintroducing, but for this trial, um, there will be one male and two females, and and it's and it's worth noting that they they won't be juvenile animals. They'll be they'll be um, adult animals, and and what I was saying in inverted commas professional links. So they'll, they'll have proved themselves to survive to adulthood. They'll know how to hunt. They'll know to avoid people, and they'll have lived successfully as a wild lynx in the origin of in the original um, home. So yeah, uh, one male, two females. <clears throat> um, how many links could the forest support and how many do you plan to introduce? So again, three for the trial. Uh, in terms of the forest support, it's certainly a lot more than that, um, a few multiples of that. My, my, my estimate would be between 10 and 14. I think that's backed up by the 
by the scientific data. Um, and again, when you extrapolate across the Southern Uplands, I think the Heatherington paper um, suggested 50 as a population across the Southern Uplands. But I think that that, that that should seriously be revised upwards, given that the densities are at least a third higher than they were when um, that original study was done, which was published in 2008. But actually, the data was collected again a couple of years before. So, and if you think about it, 16 years for a deer population with limited control um, is going to grow. But again, great questions. Um, will you be employing wardens for future protection from poachers, etc., for lynx and all the other wild species introductions? Thank you so much for all the amazing work you're doing for the introduction of lynx. Thank you, Shelley, for those kind words. Um, yeah, we would certainly will have um, employed project officers in the area who will who will work with communities to um, educate and engage. And you know, these animals will be will be collared, um, seriously monitored, which obviously reduces um, any persecution risk. But the best way to protect lynx is to get everyone behind the project. That's the best way. It doesn't matter whether it's lynx, rhinos, elephants, orangutans. If you don't have local community support, then the project will fail. Um, but And what I will say is, in, like I say, other projects, um, it is not a surprise that there is hostility from certain sectors. It's happened all across Europe. But what happens is that hostility quickly fades away when the realisation dawns that the lynx are not posing the risk that you perceive them to pose. Um, but engagement and uh, we have some fantastic um, local people who are so excited they've got so many resources produced about uh, links and educate people and engaging people so yeah um, we 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 want these links to thrive um, and we think that they will uh, Craig wants the initial trials being improved our links going to be monitored so we covered the monitoring but again it's a great question uh, GPS, the full range of full suite of issues that we monitor, as Dominic's already spoke about. Um, Pete, not really questions. Like to say, I'd love to see. I just know how these I know these iconic animals are free to run back in the UK. I'm sure there'll be a knock-on effect. Um, actually, I'm gonna, if at first you don't succeed, try try again. Well, we'll certainly be resubmitting the Pete, as, as you know, which is which is great. You know, we talked about an issue of livestock, and and again, you allude to, and you put it perfectly you know in, in non-scientific terms which is great a knock-on effect to our existing flora and fauna and that's as good a way of putting it um we've, we've talked extensively about about what we perceive to be the long-term um, benefits from links uh dowie i think that's the way to pronounce it i hope i'm not pronouncing it uh, wrong dowie uh, all the way from devon um is killer guns be the only place they are released in england and as a study i think this could take 30 years before they introduce the back to the uk um we don't know. Um, obviously, we will not preempt the results of our study, but they will be we're presented um, to both National England and Nature Scott. And uh, what, what all I will say is there's a clear pattern in Europe. Once links are introduced, countries generally want more. Um, so I, I, and so, and again, we welcome the fact that other, other groups are now looking at um, consultations in other areas for links. That, that's brilliant. So I don't think we'll be the only. Um, will be the only group looking at a trial of links um, and that's that's good and again from, from Dowie um, which source will the animals come Scan uh, they'll be Scandinavian um, Sweden we hope we have been in touch with this with the Swedish um, authorities previously um, and for the first inoculation again gene pools it's not really relevant in terms of uh, long-term genetic viability because no, this is not a reintroduction, it's just a trial, so there'll be no time for inbreeding to occur, as it were. But obviously, you wouldn't uh, do a full reintroduction with three animals. And as I say, you know, my, my genetic background is that's something I'm very, very keen to, to ensure the genetic health. But no, great questions. So we Scandinavia, and yeah, the genetic issues at this stage are not are not part of, of the trial considerations, really. Um, Sophie, I'm studying zoology and wonder if in the future I'll introduce will there be any research internships, conservation roles, focused around breeding programs. Um, there'll certainly, as Dominic said, there'll certainly be research uh, roles and people can get involved in data collection, etc. Um, there won't be any breeding programs, um, so we, we wouldn't reintroduce um, in the future captive links if, if after the trial, and as I said, these trial, these trial animals will be will be three professional links, wild links, um, but we wouldn't uh, likely use captive breeding for future 
um, or from a future reintroduction, if that happened, we would we would use uh, source populations in other areas such as uh, Romania, for example, where there's very healthy population links. But no good questions. And yeah, Sophie, feel free to, to get involved if you're interested in, in, in helping out with research. It's great. Um, I think this is the last last page of questions. I could be wrong, but I think so, from my voice goes. Um, Eurasian links are true native keystone species. The population you're introducing from only protected areas in Europe may they have a combination of those in situ. But basically, that, as 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 oh, so for that's you again. Um, so yeah, we we don't plan on using ex situ animals um, at, at this stage. Um, certainly not for the trial, and as I say for the reintroduction, then you know there'll be a, a discussion about um, if that goes ahead about about genetic management, which we'll obviously want to be a part of. Um, what behaviours or genetic trends do you expect to see once we introduce again the genetic um, issues? You know, we're not going to see, we're not going to be concerned about those for the five year trial of three animals, but you know, in the future, as I say, um, perhaps. Um, something about beavers there, uh, more native species, that's something we're, we're all um, we're all keen on. I hope everyone, I hope everyone on this, on this is watching this, whether you're pro links or not. At least we can hopefully all agree that we want healthy ecosystems, thriving ecosystems for, for us and our, our future families and whatever else. So, you know, um, it's good that other, other projects are are working and expanding in this area and as Dominic said you know rewilding and ecological restoration is is um is welcome what is being well received <clears throat> um, alan if successful and released will the government support placing links on protected areas species registered to avoid the current situation in scotland where there'd be a beaver shot in conflict areas it's supposed to be translocated you know it's no secret that there's, there's there has been issues with with beaver and controversy about um Killing beavers, obviously, we 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 would oppose that, obviously. Um, but we want these links to be protected um, by law. I think that's 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 a reasonable uh, position to to have for these animals. And but like I say, the the real protection comes from engagement and um, having a proper projects in place and having proper support in place. But no, great question. Um, again, Kevin, um, that alludes to the. Um, same issue about persecution. And from flow, um, what would happen if links was found injured? Would independent wildlife rescue centers be allowed to rehabilitate them as with other Scottish wildlife species? Great question again, welfare driven, uh, which is good. Um, so if we, we will, when we hopefully bring in the trial animals, they will we will set up um, soft release enclosures, um, which will be probably about half an acre uh, where the links can be climatized, but those those enclosures will be will be left in place for the duration of the trial. So such that if we need to capture a link, so one becomes injured, as you as you as you say, which is not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, you know, it's a it's a risky world for, for a lot of animals, um, both natural and human human threats. Uh, we can use those um, soft release enclosures to house and treat any of those links. And we have um, really good vets who we work with. I've been involved in wildlife re rehabilitation uh, for a long time as well. So yeah, we have we have expertise in that area, which is which is great. But welfare is very very important. So a good question, thank you. Um, Kevin, is there any is, is there an abundance in national food sources for lynx that would what would that food source be, and will there be supplementary feed in any trial? Um, as we've said, an abundance of deer there, up to 11 to 12 roe deer per square kilometre, which is which is high density. So there's absolutely no need whatsoever for supplementary feeding um, in in this in this trial. But um, a good question and a well thought out question. So thanks for that, Kevin. Um, okay, well, um, that's as you can see, there's a lot of questions there, and and what's what's been really exciting for us to see them come in. I mean, we have been excited watching them come in. Is the level of of how informed the questions are. You know, they're not like the 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 detailed and the interesting and the challenging and the relevant. So we can only thank you for for following our, our project, for showing interest in, your pro in our projects, and going that extra mile to to actually directly engage in in this in this consultation event. And as I say, it would be lovely to have live interaction and real face to face interaction, but. You know, we've offered people a chance to ask questions beforehand and we've answered them them now. Um, there will be further updates coming and there will be another consultation at 7 p.m. on the 17th of February. 
Um, so please keep watching our Facebook page. Please keep um, watching the news and the media. We're very good at publicizing our project, which is great. And um, thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen. We know everyone's busy. At the moment, there's lots of things going on. And um, thank you also to Dominic for, for his uh, really important input into this. And we'll see you all again soon. But 